Would you turn with me to Hebrews chapter 7? Hebrews chapter 7. We've been looking for this, or at least I have, for quite a while. Hebrews chapter 7. We're going to talk about Melchizedek. Now, who is Melchizedek? That's the entitlement of my message. Who is Melchizedek? How many of you remember Perry Mason? Do you all remember Perry Mason? Well, I love Perry Mason. You know what I loved about it? You became a detective when you watched the program. And you had to sort of help him out. Now, I believe, no, it was him right there. Did you see that right there? Did you see that clue right over there? And you, the whole program, but you've got to watch the whole thing until the last two minutes, or you never will know who did it. It is never the one you thought. Well, we're going to be Perry Mason today. We're going to look into this text and see if we can figure out who Melchizedek is. We're going to let the text teach us. Now, you know chapter 7 comes after chapter 6, and we need to tie this together. The last time we were together, we looked at verses 19, actually 16 all the way to 20, but let's look at verse 19 and 20 of chapter 6, because it's a flow. Remember, when Scripture was written, it had no chapters and no verses, so it was just a, a flow. Let's look at verse 19. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul. A hope both sure and steadfast and one which enters within the veil. Now, we know that Jesus anchors all that he said and all of his promises. He, in essence, is our hope. And then in verse 20, where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever to, in the order of Melchizedek, to the order of Melchizedek. Now, the term high priest is very important. In fact, in Hebrews, it's very important. That term is used 38 times in the book of Hebrews. Now, to understand this, you've got to understand the context. What would a high priest mean to you and I? It would not as much as it would be to a Jewish person. These are Jewish believers. And if certainly there's a rogue bunch of Jews uh, that are there trying to pull them back to Judaism. The temple was still standing. The priests were still offering animal sacrifices. These had been saved out from that but now they're being persecuted for being a Christian. The Jewish history knows persecution. Now they know it as being a believer. And somehow they began to entertain the thoughts of going back, since they came out of the Jewish faith or religion, that go back to being Jews while the persecution was going on. And you see, they would go back to an earthly high priest. They'd go back to priests offering the sacrifices. They'd go back to the animal blood that was shed that was required in the old covenant. None of it could cleanse them from dead works. None of it could produce faith. None of it would do anything that Christ could do in their life. Everything that was shadowed in the Old Testament customs is that Jesus is the substance of. And so what he's trying to do is get their focus back on Christ. He wants them and us to know that Jesus Christ is our high priest representing us before the Father forever. Now, this, this automatically tells you something. They didn't have a single high priest forever. They had a priest who would die. Then they would have another one. Then they would have another high priest. Then another high priest. I think there were 38 or so in the history of their, of their country. They just continued to have a high priest until he died. Then another one would have to come on. To have a single high priest, not on earth, but in heaven, representing us all the time, would have been something that would have tremendously gotten their attention. Christ's priesthood is according to the order of Melchizedek, and is not according to the imperfect priesthood of man, the Aaronic priesthood, the tribe of Levi. You see, all the priests had to come from the tribe of Levi. And not all Levites were a priest, but a priest had to come from that tribe and then the Aaronic line. And so what he's saying is we're of a different order. We have a high priest of a whole different economy, of a whole different covenant. His priesthood is built upon better promises. It's built on a better covenant. But who is Melchizedek? If he's to the order of Melchizedek, who is Melchizedek? It is with this question we have in verse 20 of chapter 6, that leads us right into our text in chapter 7. Now let me read verses 1, 2, and 3 of chapter 7 and kind of ease you into it. He says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, king, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham as he was returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, 
to whom also Abraham apportioned a tenth part of the spoils, which was first of all, by the translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, or Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having be neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, he remains a priest perpetually. The first time that Melchizedek is mentioned is in Genesis. He's mentioned three times in Scripture. Psalms 110, as it points to Jesus in the order of Melchizedek, which is quoted here in Hebrews, Genesis 14. And then in the book of Hebrews is the most information we have on this man named Melchizedek. Hebrews 7 deals with the first time that he's mentioned in Scripture, which would be the account in Genesis chapter 14. This event occurred after Abraham was told that Lot, remember Lot and his family, remember Abraham came to a piece of land, he said, Lot, you, you, pick, you take your choice. And Lot took what he thought was the best and went over, and, and Sodom and Gomorrah was over in that part of the property that Lot had chosen. Well, he's been taken captive, him and his whole family, by a war that was going on there. This event occurred when the kings of the east formed a confederacy and came against the kings of the west. And these kings of the west lived in that area around the Dead Sea. That's where Sodom and Gomorrah is. That's where Lot was living. Well, the kings of the east won. And so therefore, all the people that lived in those cities, they carried them off into captivity as slaves. Abraham heard about it. And he took over 300 and some of his men and armed them, which told, tells you a, 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 how, how many people he had around him. And they went into war against these kings and defeated them. And he was bringing Lot and his family back when he met the king of Sodom in a valley that's called the Valley of the Kings. And it was there that a man came out of nowhere. This, this gets so fascinating to me. He came out of nowhere. And his name was Melchizedek. Obviously a priest because Abraham bowed and gave tithes to him, a tenth of everything he had taken in the, in the battle. And he came out with, with bread and wine to greet and to bless Abraham. But who is this mysterious man? Who is Melchizedek? Where did he come from? Where did he go? He just appears and then he disappears. He was either the Lord Jesus in, in a pre-incarnate appearance in the Old Testament, or he was a literal person, a literal king, a priest, a king and a priest, by the way, who was made, made of, by God just for this occasion. I, I mean, the, God's perfect and had planned out Scripture exactly. So it could have been a literal king. So we're going to be the Perry Masons. <laughs> what is it that phrase is that, that, that is used by a major news network? We report, you decide. <laughs> you say, Wayne, you're going to do this to us again, aren't you? You did this in chapter 6. I'm going to do it to you again. You're going to have to make up your mind who you think Melchizedek is. Let's look at several things about him now. First of all, first of all, we're going to let the Scripture tell us who he is. The Scripture says he was the king of righteousness. Verse 1 of chapter 7 says, For this Melchizedek. Now, the word for is a causative particle. I know, it really blesses you. But what that does, it connects, explains everything that was just said. So he's just mentioned Melchizedek, so immediately he's going to start explaining that. It, it, it connects with verse 20. Now, this Melchizedek has a definite article before the word Melchizedek. In case anybody's wondering, this is the specific Melchizedek that's mentioned in Hebrews, Psalm 110, and Genesis 14. In other words, there may have been somebody else by that name. I don't know. But this is the one we're talking about. The word Melchizedek is defined in verse 2. Scripture defines it for us. Look, he says the last part of verse 2. He was, first of all, by the translation of his name, king of righteousness. Now, this Melchizedek was the king of righteousness. Now, the word for righteousness there is the word diakosini. Diakosini is, is important because it means that which one does. It's that which one does that is so right that God looks at it and says, that's good. Now, for a person to produce righteousness, they have to, first of all, be righteous. Of course, you know that Jesus Christ became our righteousness, so they had to be righteous. In other words, for, to do what's right 
to totally. To do everything that's right, you have to be righteous. Only God is righteous. For him to be the king of righteousness, he'd have to be righteous. According to Scripture then, Melchizedek came out of nowhere. He's the king of righteousness. But secondly, he was the king of Salem, or Salem, as we would say in our <laughs> horrible English. But that's the word. It comes to the Salem, or Salem, comes from the word shalom, as you'll see in a minute. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem. Now, the word king, Basileus, means, is used in, in verse 2, and, and it has the idea of a, a, a ruler, a monarch, somebody who is king. I mean, he's, he's over. In other words, you never talk about a man's kingdom until you talk about who the king is. The, the, the kingdom is totally exemplary of the king. And so this person is the king of righteousness, but he's also the king of Salem. Now, in verse 2, in the last part of it, he says he's the king of peace. He says he's the king of Salem, which is king of peace. Now, that's the Scripture translating this for us. Many scholars and ancient historians, including Josephus, think that the Salem refers to Jerusalem, that it's a literal place. They think that the word Jireh, which is the word we get Jehovah Jireh, provider, it, it should have been hooked into the word Salem, Jerusalem. But, but there are many who don't think that. For cause of verse 2, and the reason they don't think it's a city is because he didn't mention it as, as a city. He mentioned it as peace. He described it. He even translated it. They believe that it does not refer to a place, but it refers to a divine attribute that only God can produce. Peace. He's the king, ruler of, governor over, keeper of, giver of, peace. It's referring to, to the peace that is used also, of, we see in the New Testament, that only Christ can give. Isaiah chapter 9, and I love Christmas. I love the Christmas. I get into Christmas spirit about July. And I love the hymns, and I love the songs, and I love the, the music of Christmas because of the celebration of the birth of Christ coming into the very world He Himself created. And, and, it, and it uses the word, instead of king, it uses the word ruler, or prince, rather, and then it uses the word peace. Let me, let me read that to you. In Isaiah 9, 6, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called. Now look at the names that will be of the Lord Jesus. Wonderful. And his name shall be called. <laughs> I wish I could sing. Wonderful. Counselor. Mighty God. Eternal Father. Prince. And the word definition there is almost identical to the word king, ruler of peace. When the king was out of town, the prince would take over and have all of authority. So it, it carries with it the same idea and the same meaning. So here's the question. Is Salim a place, a literal place that this man was king over? Or is Salim a divine attribute such as righteousness? Well, what do we know so far? Who is this Melchizedek? We're doing our investigations. First of all, he's king of righteousness. Secondly, he's king of peace. And by the way, these two characteristics introduced in the Psalms in this order describe the kingdom that Jesus will bring to this earth. And it has to be in that order. You cannot put peace and then righteousness. It has to be righteousness and then peace. And they're used exactly that way to describe the kingdom that Jesus one day will bring to this earth. Number three, let's look at another one. He's the priest of the Most High God. Verse 1, for this Melchizedek, or king of righteousness, king of Salem, or Salem, which is king of peace, priest of the Most High God. Now, the fact that a king would serve as a priest ought to grab you immediately. This is a curveball he just threw at the Jewish culture because there was a line that the kings came out of, and there was a tribe that the priests came out of, but you didn't mix the two. They knew, we know from Scripture, how God treated King Uzziah when he took over the role of a priest and went into the temple to offer incense. This, this, he was treated very badly. And so you see that the, you don't mix the two. However, Jesus is, is, is told that he would be king and he would be priest and he would also be prophet. In other words, that he was coming one day. And so those two things would automatically signal 
that he has something to say very strange here to the Jewish mindset. What struck me was that as a king, he was in authority, and as a priest, he was under authority. The word priest is the word ereus, and here in the text refers to one who serves the Most High God. He describes one who is at the beck and call of the Most High God. A priest of the Most High God lived to do his will. The Most High God uses the word ipsistos, and it means the highest. There is none higher. The loftiest, the, the most elevated, talking about our God. He is a servant to God. Now, the God to whom there is none higher or loftier, this king of, 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 of righteousness, this king of priests, serves him totally. Now, Melchizedek was the king of righteousness, king of peace, but, but he was a priest of the Most High God. There's, there's a no definite article before the word priest, which doesn't point out something here uh, to identify him. We already, we already have identified that, but it talks, it, it qualifies. When there's no definite article, it just talks about all the different ministries that a, that a priest would do in serving the Most High God. But the last part of verse 3 even says that he remains a priest perpetually or forever. Now, the word perpetually, the, the nikis, is the word that means continuous, forever, never ending. So Melchizedek throws a curveball, doesn't he? Because they had a priest that would live to a certain time and die. Another priest who would live to a certain time and die. But this particular priest, this king of righteousness, this king of peace, a servant of the Most High God, was a priest to God forever. So who is he? It interests me that when Jesus came to this earth, he served his Father. Remember, as a man, he came as a man. He's always been God. The Son of God became the Son of Man born in a woman's womb, came, as, came to the very earth he created as a seed and was birthed, the only one who could become greater by becoming less. Got to feel the grass that he made, breathe the air that he himself made. But it interests me, while he was here, he came to do the will of his Father. The Gospel of John is filled with this. John five nineteen. therefore Jesus answered and was saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of Himself unless it is something He sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. Another one, John 14, 10, do you not believe that I am in the Father, Jesus speaking here, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does the work. In other words, everything, He was a reflex of the Father totally a servant to his father as the God-man. He came to do the will of the Father. Who is this Melchizedek? Well, he's the king of righteousness. He's also the king of peace, and he's a priest of the Most High God forever. And that's, that's very important, forever. Fourthly, Melchizedek had no pedigree according to man. Now listen, ped pedigree was very important. What tribe are you from? If you're not from a tribe of Levi, you can never be a priest. What, what line are you from? If you're not of David, you, you cannot be a king or whatever. It was very important to the Jewish mindset where you came from, who your mom and daddy were, what kind of pedigree you had. It says in verse 3, without father, without mother, without genealogy. Now, without father is a simple little compound word, a patir. A means without, okay? It's a privative a. And then patir is father, without father. M mother, without mother is the same exact thing except for the word uh, amitor is the word for mother. It's just without mother. Now, when this priest appeared to Abraham, there was no human record of any earthly mother or any earthly father, and yet Abraham paid no attention to that and bowed down and gave him a tenth of all the spoils he had taken in war. Without genealogy, the word ah, the word we get the word genealogy from, which means pedigree according to man. He's referring to the fact that there was no record of this priest anywhere of any human lineage. 
And this, like I said, you, you have to understand the mindset of how, who this is written to and, and how they would receive this. And what he's basically saying is, you're going to go back to the earthly priest to die after a certain time, and then another one, then another one. And this priest right here has nothing to do with that, has no lineage that would tie him to that priesthood whatsoever, has no lineage that would tie him to the economy of that priesthood. So who is Melchizedek? He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of peace, a priest of the Most High God forever with no pedigree from mankind whatsoever. Fifthly, Melchizedek had no beginning and no end, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, having, possessing. It's word echo in the present tense, having. He, he didn't possess any kind of birth record. Uh, the, the word days is days of his life. The word beginning, our key, beginning, which means beginning, the origination of something. You can't point back. I was born in Lewis Gale Hospital in Roanoke, Virginia, July the 27th, 19, a long time ago. <laughs> and there's a record of my birth. One day I'll die, and it'll be a record of my death, unless the Lord Jesus comes before that time. It means that there was no record of any birth and no record of death. Now, who, who is this Melchizedek? He doesn't fit the priestly line. Why would he be called a high priest? Are you kidding? He has no mother, no father, no pedigree. He has no record of birth, no record of death. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of peace. He's the servant, a priest of the Most High God forever. And then number six, he was made like, it says, the Son of God. Verse three, without father, without mother, without genealogy, neither, neither, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, he remains a priest perpetually. Now, he uses a word here for made that's the word uh, it's kind of hard to say. It's not, it's only used one time in the whole New Testament, and it really threw me. He was made. That's where a lot of people jump up and say, see, it has to be an ordinary man who was the king of Jerusalem. But then I began to look at that. It's the synonym. You know what a synonym is? It means the same thing. It's a synonym. Antonym means the opposite. It's a synonym of that word, even though this word is only used one time is the word echo, which means to be like or to resemble. Uh-oh. Interesting, isn't it? Made like or likened or resembling the Son of God. Now, the word before the word Son is a definite article, and it points to the Son of God. Made like Jesus is the Son of God. And so he resembles the Lord Jesus. Uh, the word for son there is always used of the Lord Jesus. It's the word eos, H-U-I-O-S. Now, when you have a child, he's first born, nepios. Can't walk, can't talk, got to feed him, got to carry him. That's nepios. That means he's pretty helpless. When he gets a little, little older, he's technon. Technon means he probably resembles the mama, the daddy. And then pedion is another word for child, which means he, he's about six, seven, eight years old, and, and uh, maybe he's going into his teenage years, and he, all the brain cells have died, but he needs, he needs teaching. He needs help. But when he gets to the point that before you even ask him to mow the yard, he mows it. Before you even ask him to do whatever it is, he does it. He's so totally in sync with the will of the Father, there's another word, and that's the word yos. And that's the word used here. That's the word used for Jesus every time that you see it. So, it's always used of the Lord Jesus Christ made like, resembling, likened to the Son of God, the mature, totally in sync with the Father, Son of God. He remains a priest forever. We saw that earlier, as it says in verse 3, remains as minnow, which basically in present tense, he continues to remain a priest forever. He'll always be that. He's not out of any order of priest from mankind. Now, I have reported, <laughs> you decide. Who do you think he is? You think he's a little king? And many, many, you're in great company because they feel the same way. You said, Wayne, you're going to tell us what you think. All right, I'm going to tell you. Personally, I think it's a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ to Abraham. And I think when he brought the bread and wine out, he brought it out to celebrate 2,000 years before it ever happened what we celebrate that happened 2,000 years back, the death and the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ and the blood that he would shed. 
You see, I believe in chapter 14, actually in chapter 12, he appeared to him in covenant and made a covenant with him, promised to him. In chapter 14, I believe he appeared to him again. This is the Lord Jesus in the Old Testament. He said, how could that be? The beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He's always been. And you see him all through history. He's the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. But I believe he appeared to him in chapter 14 and, took, and even sat down, and they celebrated what was coming one day in a seed that had been promised to him. The 15th chapter, if you'll read it very closely, when God covenanted with Abraham, he put him to sleep. Read who it was that walked between the, the halves of those animals and compare it to Revelation as a description of the Lord Jesus himself. Cut that covenant right there of grace. In chapter 15 or chapter 17, he changes his name. Now he's in covenant with him. It's Abraham. It used to be Abram until chapter 17. Sarai became Sarah. And then in chapter 22, when he has him take Isaac up on the mountain, it says the angel of the Lord appeared, promised him again that that seed was coming, promised him again that, that it would take place, just like he had promised him in back of chapter 12, covenanted with him in chapter 15, celebrated what was going to happen in chapter 14. And then in chapter 22, he, he swore by his own name, because there was none above him he could swear, to double assure him that he was coming. And it says in the Gospels that Abraham saw his day, Jesus said, rejoiced, and he was glad. You say, Wayne, prove it. I can't. <laughs> you see, this is one of those situations where you can be wrong and I can be right and it's okay. Or I can be right and you can be wrong and it's okay. It's one or the other. Hey, by the way, you can't prove your point either. You cannot do it. You're going to have to put as much into it as I put on the other side. So what's the deal, Wayne? Why did you go through this? Because the main thing is the plain thing. What's the main thing he's trying to say here? He's trying to get across the fact that Jesus Christ is our eternal high priest of a totally different order than anything the Jews had ever experienced or would ever experience. It has nothing to do with man. And by the way, it has nothing to do with the law because he fulfilled the very law that he gave. In fact, the order and the way he works under the new, which we'll find in chapter 8, by the way, the new covenant, is so totally and radically different from how the law operates and how the earthly priest would operate, you have to almost dismiss this in order to live over here. And he tells us how simple it is over here. This is grace, the covenant that he's here for, and law is the one that's over here. You understand the difference? You know, for seven and a half years I've been trying to say it, probably haven't been clear. Let me see if I can do it this way. Under law, it's up to you. Performance mentality. And you better do it, and there's judgment if you don't. And that judgment is heavy, and it breeds fear in everybody who's up under that law. It makes you judgmental and critical of everybody around you. Law is not where you want to go. He fulfilled that as a man for us. Now, under law, it's commitment. Under grace, it's surrender. Under law, it's up to you. Under grace, it's up to Him. Under law, it's your responsibility. Under grace, it's your response to His ability. Now, which one would you rather live up under? And that's where Hebrews is headed, folks. That's, I don't know what is it. <laughs> that must be important. I'll say that again. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. <laughs> Pay attention. No. <laughs> you say, wait, what can I take home with me? That's what you take home with you. Which covenant are you going to live up under? Which priest do you want? Do you want one who has to go in for his own sins every once a year that can only, by the, you see, only blood can remit, can remit sins. And, but the blood of animals and bulls and goats, that could just cover it. It had to be the blood of Jesus who offered, he was the sacrifice once for all that now we don't have to go back and do that all the time. When you get saved, you are forgiven right then. You are cleansed and forgiven right then. And we don't confess sin so we can get forgiveness. We confess sins because we've already been forgiven. It's a whole different mentality. So my question to you this morning, and, and I know it's difficult trying to decide who Melchizedek is, and you can go home and say, that, that, that Wayne, he's, he's, he's nutter in a fruitcake. That's okay. But just remember, I'm saying the same thing about you because you can't prove your point either. But the bottom line is, do you see what he's saying? of a different economy. Don't tag him to the Aaronic priesthood. Don't put him in the tribe of Levi. He didn't come out of there. 
Don't put his economy in the way he works up under this mentality. And I want to tell you something. That has been the problem of the church since its first inception. And every time Paul ever warned them of false doctrine, it was the legalism that would get back into the church. The judgmental attitudes, the fact that you live under fear all the time. Listen, we respect and we honor and we reverence, yes. But I don't run from him, I run to him. Under the law, buddy. That, that he fulfilled it, dotted every dot, crossed every T. And now we're of a brand new covenant. You know what he tells me to do? It's so hard. He just says, submit and surrender to me, Wayne. That's all it is. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. The moment I say yes to him is the moment I just said no to my flesh. My flesh cannot perform when I'm saying yes to him. Yes, Lord. I can't. You never said I could. You can. You always said you would. That's where he's headed in Hebrews. We got a brand new high priest. We got a brand new covenant. Why would you want to go back to Judaism, which is only a shadow? Why would you not want to walk in the substance, which is Christ and what he offers to you? So I suppose as we close today, I guess the, the, the thing is to let you ask a question of yourself. Are you living under law or are you living under grace? Under law, you got a problem. But under grace, it's already been solved. And you live in Him and His life in you. Galatians 5, 14 says, Love, the, the whole law is fulfilled by how many words? One word. And, it's, and it's, it's love. And then in verse 22, it says what produces it. The fruit of His Spirit is the very love that fulfills everything He requires in your life. And He lives within you to produce it. So we're either going to live under grace or you can make the choice. You can live under law. You can go back or you can go on one or the other.